Hello, this is Don Tomaszewski from Valley Health Lifestyles, and I'm here to present Exercise is Medicine. I've given this talk quite a few times, and well, um, we just updated a little bit of stuff here, but you know, overall, exercise, the idea here is that we're using exercise to help prevent chronic diseases. We already use exercise to treat chronic diseases, and um, and uh, rehabilitate people. So it makes sense that physical activity and exercise um, is a useful way to prevent and uh, treat chronic diseases. So let me get started with some facts today. OK. okay. So the problem, physical inactivity is the fastest growing public health problem in America right now. Physical activity is a um, physical inactivity uh, is basically considered an ep epidemic <clears throat> with tremendous health costs. Um, the way society has been going uh, over the past several decades is, is things are becoming more and more automated, as you know and we're moving less. So as we're moving less, what we're seeing is it's taking a toll on our physical health. Right. The healthcare costs of physical activity because it causes chronic diseases, right, is very high. And you can see here in one study in 2008, um, they estimated that it was $330 per person per year and healthcare costs just attributed to that. And more recently in 2018, um, the total costs were $117 billion annually, uh, is what they estimated um, up from 2008 here, as you see. So the problem, um, one of the reasons, one of the things that we're going to talk about today is um, is how do we, how do we, um, combat physical inactivity and the chronic diseases associated with it. So the American College of Sports Medicine set out to do this um, and try to promote physical activity. And the first population of people that they chose to work with were physicians, all right? So getting physicians on board with physical activity. If a physician tells you to exercise, you are more likely, you're probably 40% more likely to comply with a physical activity prescription if a physician tells you to do it versus anybody else. So the idea of having physicians comfortable enough to give prescriptions of physical uh, activity or exercise is extremely important. Physicians typically, traditionally, if they're not familiar with the, um, the medicine, or the cure or the treatment, they won't prescribe it. And that's what they found. So the American College of Sports Medicine set up a um, this campaign, which is Exercises Medicine. This is their campaign. And they set out to um, uh, in, in, uh, inform and to teach physicians in medical school um, the basics of physical activity, the benefits of physical activity, and how to prescribe it. And so as of now, um, and uh, within the last four years, every um, medical school in the country has to provide at least one class in physical activity prescription, exercise prescription. So that's successful. Since then, exercise medicine has been expanded to the public, to the universities, and of course, here at Valley Hospital, Valley Health System and Lifestyles, we embrace this concept of exercise as medicine. And so the goal here is to make physical activity uh, assessment and promotion a standard in clinical care. So for example, when you go to your physician for a well visit, they ask you a number of questions. They take your blood pressure, they take your heart rate. All right, um, with the exercise as medicine campaign, um, the idea is for them to ask physical activity questions and to assess your, your uh, physical activity level because physical inactivity, not doing enough activity, um, is actually a risk factor for a number of health conditions. And you're gonna see that as we go along today, um, 
so this is the idea here is, is to make this a standard so that when you go see your physician, they talk about physical activity every time you're in, put it in your health record, and then give you the resources to, uh, to get physically active safe. So as we go through this, you'll see um, it's the fourth leading phys physical inactivity is the is is uh, the fourth uh, on the list of causes of death behind hypertension, smoke, and hyperglycemia. All right, and when we've studied people who have hypertension, for example, when they become more physically active and they lose some weight, for example, um, they can drop their their um their blood pressure. People who are on um, borderline hypertensive um, may actually come completely off their medication because their blood pressure drops as much as 10%. Or I'm sorry, um, two millimeters or more could actually cause a reduction in and help a reduction in cardiac conditions and stroke. So, um, what is what are these conditions called? Well, they're grouped into a group of um, conditions and diseases called hypokinetic diseases and conditions. All right, and these have a direct correlation to being physically inactive. So if you take the word hypo, it's below, and kinetic means movement. So low movement, low movement conditions. There's a number of them. So you may not have known this, but diabetes, obesity, hypertension, coronary artery disease, although they have other factors associated with them. Um, physical inactivity and a lack of physical activity on a regular basis is a direct, has a direct correlation. It is a risk factor. It is a cause for a tremendous number of diseases and conditions. Most popular ones listed here. So what do we, what do we do? Um, as we move through this, we'll talk about um, a prescription of exercise, using exercise as we would medicine. So there was a study that was done. Um, there was a report that was put out a few years ago in 2018 and by the CDC. And um, after um, screening every other causes, all other causes out and factors out, um, they were able to isolate uh, data that su suggests that um, 8% of those 18,800 deaths were attributed directly to in inadequate physical activity levels, right? It rose as the individuals got higher in age, so the, uh, the older they were, um, that age group, it actually was higher. So recommendations, as you'll see, we go through um, is 150 to 300 minutes of moderate intensity physical activity. We'll talk more about that as we go through here, all right? Just so some more evidence regarding the benefits of exercise, all right? Uh, benefits of physical activity. Um, it's been said that it exposes the patient to a greater risk of dying than smoking, obesity, hypertension, and high cholesterol um, for older men, all right? And, if for, and for older men, regular physical activity can decrease the risk of death by 40%. So think about that, all right? Um, physical activity or physical inactivity um, as being a cause of early mortality, dying early, risk of dying. Um, it's, it's, it's right up there with all those other risk factors that we know already are, wrong, are, are, are bad, with smoking, obesity, and hypertension. The benefits of physical activity, being physically active, benefits of exercise. Um, there's a plethora of benefits and there's a long, long list of them. As you can see a few of the benefits here, all right? And pay attention to some of the newer benefits that, that have come out um, after um, you know an, another decade of studying. So between 2008 and 2018, the um, Center for Disease Control and the National Institute for Health reevaluated um, the data and the recommendations and were able to, to further substantiate the benefits of physical activity, including improving cognition, lowering risks of seven different types of cancers. Initially, uh, they were able to draw conclusions uh, of direct correlation with two different types of cancers. So a number of different, you know, a, a lot more evidence now supports, further supports physical activity 
as a way to prevent and uh, treat chronic diseases and illnesses. So you can see that list is quite long. All right, some of the newer health benefits that have come out that I can report to you uh, is that there's a positive correlation. So there is, um, there is um, from a research standpoint, there is very strong evidence to support uh, the benefits of physical activity, all right? Long-term benefits, short-term benefits. Um, and uh, you can see here, even with just short, with a short, you know, within a short period of time, we quickly see, or, uh, researchers quickly see reductions in anxiety because a bout of exercise re re do, uh, releases neurotransmitters that help us change our mood. It helps our sleep immediately. Our blood pressure changes, the diameter of our blood vessels changes if one uh, session of physical activity. So there's a number of short-term benefits uh, with exercise uh, and physical activity. Uh, the long-term benefits, all right, which which many of us are familiar with, but these are these are uh, a list of that has recently been been added, and, and that is is um, you know different types of we've mentioned uh, prevents different types of cancers, uh, reduces dementia, and Alzheimer's. So there's a there's a connection of mind body connection. You've heard of that before, of course, but there's now evidence, strong evidence to support that physical activity of being physically active on a regular basis helps delay the onset of dementia and Alzheimer's diseases. All right, for uh, it also reduces your risks of falling. All right, which which, you know, when you fall, you can break a hip. When you break a hip, you don't move. And it's it's a downward spiral for a lot of older individuals. So uh, improving balance and strength and reducing fall risk is a huge benefit uh, from from being physically active being and exercising. All right, so metabolic disease this is kind of a combination of things many people don't realize they have this but there is a uh, um, a syndrome all right uh, and it's it's pretty common it's uh, somebody who has uh, they're overweight they have high blood lipids or cholesterol levels they have high blood sugar and they have high cortisol levels all right in combination these things are responsible for diabetes heart disease and um it's considered metabolic disease. It's a bad, vicious cycle. Uh, and physical activity has been shown to be able to break that cycle and reduce these risk factors of metabolic disease. It can lower your chances of developing type 2 or adult onset diabetes by 58%, reducing the need for insulin and other medications. So again, a great example and evidence that exercise or physical activity is medicine. It reduces the need for hypertensive drugs and it reduces the need for insulin and diabetes. It's actually a part of the treatment. There's a trilogy of treatments for diabetes. And um, in, in, in addition to insulin and medication and diet, it's physical activity. So it's once been said that it's better to be physically fit and overweight than unfit with a lower percentage of body fat. All right. So I'll say that again. It's been shown that being physically fit, physically active on a regular basis is actually better for you, all right? And we find people are healthier than individuals who have a normal weight but don't exercise on a regular basis. Right? So exercising on a regular basis, um, uh, ir you know, ir regardless of your weight and your percent body fat, is it, it, there's a health benefit to it, all right? So, Usually, a lot of times people look at physical activity and exercise and go, oh, well, if I don't lose weight, then it's, it's not helping. No, there, there is a benefit of being physically active, even if you are overweight and remain overweight. If you don't lose a pound and you become more physically active on a regular basis, you will become healthier. All right. So you might have heard this, that sitting is the new smoking. So there's a positive relationship or a correlation that's been um, supported now with research that shows that sedentary behavior, a lot of sitting, all right, uh, reduces your, um, your life expectancy, all right? 
So sedentary behavior increases the risk of all causes of mortality, increases the risk of cardiovascular type 2, diabetes, and different types of cancers. Right? So as you can see on this little graph here, that's kind of simple, but the more you move and the more you do um, from a physical activity standpoint, and the less you're inactive, the less you're sedentary and sitting, all right, um, it reduces your, your overall cause of mortality there. Extends your life and the quality of life too. Not just your life in years, but the quality of your life improves when you're physically active. All right. So there's another statistic or, or um, a point here, and that is active individuals in their 80s have a lower risk of death than inactive individuals in their 60s. Right? And again, the idea is irrelevant of your age and your weight, being physically active has independent health benefits. We talked about reducing cancer, but exercise also it boosts your immune system. And uh, individuals who may have cancer or may be in treatment for cancer, um, uh, their immune systems are affected and they're more susceptible to flu and pneumonia and infection and being physically active, even during treatment, right? Uh, even at low levels, being physically active boosts the immune system. Right? You can see here there's a physiological change when we exercise, all right? 20% increase in natural killer cells in our body, all right, that help either one, improve the treatment, all right, or the effectiveness of a treatment or a chemotherapy. Um, so being physically active actually helps improve the effectiveness of the medications and treatments that in people people undergo, but it also helps reduce symptoms and fatigue. Um, and uh, you know, exercise independent of the disease process that's going in your, on in your body, whether it be um, cancer or heart disease. Independent of that. Um, your body releases chemicals and provides a, a boost in the immune system. So as we move on to the heart, all right, um, you may um, have heard, of course, that exercise and being physically active decreases your triglycerides and your cholesterol levels and controls blood sugar. But it also reduces your LDLs, and this is the bad cholesterol. So when you take your cholesterol levels and you break them out, even if you've got you know, your cholesterol is under 200 total. If your HDLs are low, it becomes a risk factor. So HDLs are also, or these are the good love, good cholesterols, um, go higher or get raised um, uh, when we're physically active on a regular basis, especially if it's prolonged physical activity over 20, 30 minutes. So the longer we're exercising on a regular basis uh, in any given bout, it, it helps improve our HDLs, which is the good cholesterol and helps protect your blood vessels. <clears throat> so just some numbers here from cardiovascular disease risk factor standpoint, all right? The incidence of heart disease and hypertension are all lowered by somebody who is physically active on a regular basis. All the more reason for your physician, for your cardiologist to ask you these questions. Right. Do you exercise on a regular basis? Are you physically active? So they really do need to assess your physical activity level because it's such a risk factor to be physically inactive. American Heart Association has a question that's been asking for years. We ask this when we prepare people for exercise. We do this in our physical uh, activity screenings for individuals. Uh, and this is the question, one of the questions that we want physicians uh, to ask at the well visit, and that is, do you get 30 minutes, at least 30 minutes of moderate intensity exercise at least three days a week? All right, so do you get at least 30 minutes of moderate level of intensity, physical activity, or exercise at least three days a week? If you answer no to that question, you, you have uh, an increased risk for cardiovascular disease. All right, so there are um, a number of risk factors. There's 11 cardiovascular risk factors that have been identified. Um, four of them you can't change, all right? So our age, our race, our sex, and our family history, we can't change that, okay? But there's seven changeable ones, and one of them is physical activity. So it has actually been identified right up there with hypertension, being overweight, high cholesterol, and physical inactivity. So it's right up there with all the other risk factors with cardiovascular disease that we're all well aware of. 
Um, you may not have been aware that physical inactivity is a major risk factor for cardiovascular disease. So ask yourself that question. So in addition to chronic diseases and conditions, there's a musculoskeletal benefit, all right, which actually may be more obvious for people or more popular when we are physically active, our muscles become more toned. We may lose weight, but we may not. All right. But things that happen also um, is that when we do become more toned and our muscles are used on a more regular basis, um, the calories that are burned, all right, um, from a bout of strength training, for example, all right, are extended well beyond the exercise bout itself. So, for example, if I walk on a treadmill for an hour, I burn calories. When I stop, I stop burning the calories. When I strength train and I work my muscles and my muscles become active, uh, when I stop that bout of, of uh, strength training, my muscles continue to burn fuel for hours afterwards. All right, so it's multiplicative. And then as my muscles become more toned, all right, they burn more fuel at rest. So think of a V8 engine, think of a four cylinder engine sitting at a light. They're both sucking down gas, but the V8 is gonna burn more fuel. So more tone, um, not necessarily big bulky muscles, but more tone muscles burn more fuel at rest. It increases your metabolism. Guess what happens when you get older? Just past middle age, all right? So as we pass the, uh, the 40th, fourth decade of our life, um, our metabolism drops 1% per year, 10% per decade. So by the time you're 80 years old, you've got a 40% less, your metabolism is 40% lower than it used to be. Strength training, resistance training, exercise on a regular basis improves our metabolism and helps us maintain a higher metabolism. Also helps with posture and balance control. We talked about that, reducing your risk factors for falling. And musculoskeletal wise, it helps strengthen our bones. So being physically active on a regular basis, especially strength training, right? Strength training, specifically for your upper body and your lower body, it will reduce the risk of osteoporosis by strengthening your bones. And overall, being physically active, it allows us to do our normal daily activities um, and enjoy life. It's also been shown that the benefits of exercise improve your sleep quality. And improved sleep, of course, has a number of different benefits itself. So, um, you know, a lot of these factors, they correlate directly, but they also are, are intertwined. So if I'm sleeping better because I'm exercising, my mood's improved. Um, with good sleep health, good sleep hygiene, I reduce um, my risk of obesity. I reduce my risk of hypertension. All right, um, and uh, reduce depression. So there's a number of things that are interrelated and associated with it. So getting good exercise, getting good sleep, um, go hand in hand with um, reducing risks of chronic diseases, both physically and cognitively or mental, mental health. It improves our mental health. So exercise stimulates our brain, reduces cognitive decline, and a number of studies have shown this, and and as we reported earlier, is, is that you know reducing or delaying dementia and the onset of Alzheimer's has been now proven and shown with uh, with research. There's strong evidence to support that, All right? And even just one bout of of, of physical activity. When we looked at kids. Um, um, doing about a physical activity, a moderate level of physical activity, just prior to sitting down and taking a test, their scores improved. All right, so scores improved when they were physically active just prior to taking a test. So um, habitually, um, you know, kids who exercise on a regular basis, as, as with adults, exercise on a regular basis, have better cognitive function. So we talked about physical inactivity. We talked about the risk factors, talked about the problem. We talked about physical activity being the solution to the problem, all right? And there's guidelines that have come out and you may have heard them, but um, the most recent guidelines that have come out are 150 minutes per week of moderate intensity physical activity. Now, you notice here I didn't say exercise all the time. I use physical activity and exercise, um, they're kind of synonymous. 
And, and the reason why I do that is because physical uh, exercise for a lot of people is noxious. All right, so I'll say that again. Exercise for a lot of people is noxious. They don't like exercising. They don't like sweating. They don't like the feeling of exercising. Um, and the view of exercise is, you know, a lot of times in, in the public eye uh, is promoted as a weight loss uh, only. And you're going to get big muscles and it's only for athletes. Well, that's not true. So I, instead of seeing exercise all the time, I like using physical activity. So you as an older adult, um, who may not like exercise um, still needs to do physical activity and you may find that hiking you may find that walking you may find that gardening you may find that um you know doing things you enjoy doing um, taking the stairs instead of the elevator being more physically active is what we're talking about and you're able to accumulate this throughout the day all right so within a week if you can accumulate 150 minutes of moving at a moderate level of intensity. In other words, to a point where you feel like whew, you did something, all right? You're breathing a little heavier, your heart's beating. That's a moderate level of intensity. It's similar to a brisk walk. That's what a moderate level is. So that's the prescription is to move and be physically active. Try to get 150 minutes total, accumulatively throughout the day, throughout the week. So how do we start? on our road to being more physically active. I got some general exercise guidelines. We're not gonna get into a whole lot of detail here because um, there's actually a second part to this, um, this presentation um, on, on what to do and what are the next steps. So we'll talk about that in a little bit, but generally um, you should, the prescription is to get exercise and be physically active at least three days a week at a moderate level of intensity. So that hasn't changed. At least 30 minutes, three days a week at a moderate level of intensity. Could you exercise every day? You could, you could. Most days of the week is the general recommendation from the Surgeon General. Be physically active most days of the week. Accumulate 150 minutes total throughout the week. So on a daily basis, if I did um, you know, 30 to 60 minutes uh, at a moderate level of intensity five days a week, that's my 150. All right, so some simple math there. As I bring up the intensity, right, for example, the recommendation actually uh, for minutes drops. So with higher intensity, um, we only need about 75 to 100 minutes of physical activity per week if the intensity is higher. And what a lot of people do is they combine the two. So some moderate level of intensity, some higher levels of intensity, maybe one or two days a week you do higher level of intensity and it helps you reach that minimum guideline. Okay, longer duration are better. However, if you can get out and do something and you can only tolerate it for 10 minutes, that's okay. Do it, be, at, be physically active, take your break and then get up and do it again. So for example, we tell people to go take a walk in the mall at a brisk pace and once you're tired, you can stop, take a break, recover and get up and do it again. So you're doing bouts. So it doesn't have to be 60 minutes all at one time. It could be 10 minutes in the morning. It could be 20 minutes in the afternoon. It could be another 15 minutes, you know, in the evening after dinner, taking a, a brisk walk. Accumulatively throughout the day, we want to accumulate that num that those number of minutes of, of being physically active. And the more days a week you do it, the less you have to do in that given day. Resistance training is recommended twice a week. All right, uh, so our muscles have time to recover. Now, could you do push-ups and sit-ups? strength training every day you could but the higher the intensity level the more time your muscles need to recover all right so on our next part two of this presentation i'll get into a lot more detail about how to do resistance training and why we need to separate uh, a little more time in between those bouts of exercise but again depends on your intensity all right you could stretch daily keep flexible and um this last bullet here is really important, uh, and that is, 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 is it should be a challenge and you need to progress, all right? So do what you can up to your level of tolerance. There are a number of people who have chronic diseases already, such as arthritis and cardiovascular disease, uh, lung disease, and they're limited in what they can do physically. It doesn't mean you shouldn't exercise. It means you need to exercise and be physically active up to your level that you can tolerate. It should be a challenge. And as it's a challenge, your body adapts. And as it adapts, it becomes stronger. So after um, 
setting up your exercise plan. The components of the exercise plan include a cardiovascular component, which is an aerobic component for your heart and your lungs, a strength training component where you're doing resistance training, you're working your muscles and going through ranges of motion and using the muscles throughout your body. So upper body, lower body, arms, legs, stomach, and back muscles especially need to be um, they need resistance from time to time in order to in order to to, uh, to continue to to be toned and to and to help you function normally. Muscle flexibility is always a good thing. When we become inflexible, especially in our hamstrings or our, our which are in the back of our legs or our, our our low back, it changes the way we walk, changes our posture, changes our mechanics, and therefore sets you up for um, for falls and uh, for for other other types of injuries. All right. And your exercise routine, a lot of times, is based on your specific needs. So by no means is the exercise prescription the same, just like if you went to the doctor. He doesn't write the same prescription for everybody. Everybody's exercise or physical activity prescription needs to meet your goals and needs to be specific and individualized to you. So there are some uh, basic principles of physical uh, of exercise um, that I'll leave you with today. And then um, on part two of this presentation, we will go over these uh, in detail. But generally, the primary principle of physical activity in order for it to be healthful for you and get, reap the health benefits of physical activity, there has to be overload. There has to be stress on the body. Um, so when we say it feels like a challenge or you need to do something that's at moderate level of intensity, that is directly related to the overload principle, all right? So that's why, hey, physical activity, if you're sitting on the couch doing nothing and you get up and you move at a low level, that's better than doing nothing. However, if you really want to reap the health benefits that we just went over in this presentation, there needs to be a challenge. It needs to feel like um, you're doing more than normal. So there needs to be some stress in the body and then your body adapts, changes, and that's when you reap the benefits of physical activity. So there needs to be a challenge. So intensity level is really important when we're putting together your exercise prescription. Symmetry, you want to do upper and lower body. You want to do front and back. Don't, you know, we have so many people who exercise and don't think about their back muscles. And, um, and uh, you know, we need to be symmetrical here. We need to do strength training. We need to do cardio. We need to do flexibility. Uh, in giving equal time to each area. Core stabilization, it's a fancy word that's been out there now, it's, you know, there are core exercises, but basically it's your back, it's your belly, it's your hips, and that's a, that's, there's a lot of power and there's a lot of activity. Everything you do, all your movements throughout the day, whether it be sitting, sleeping, turning, standing, or walking, come from your core. And so we need to make sure that we build a great foundation and help. And that helps with balance. It helps with reducing uh, fall risk and helps with um, uh, maintaining healthy posture and um, doing activities of daily living. There needs to be recovery. So when we do overload our body and we do exercise and we do challenge our body, our body needs time to adapt. And that's the recovery phase. So recovery, believe it or not, is part of it. Rest is part of exercise. All right, so proper rest in between bouts of exercise is important to do. Otherwise, we would overtrain uh, and and uh, and create other issues. So recovery is a part of an exercise prescription. And then, of course, progression. All right, there should be a gradual increase in the overload of the physical activity over a period of time. All right, so nobody should be rushing to it, and 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 it's not a it's not a fast process. These benefits, although there's some short-term benefits of exercise after one bout, the true long-term benefits of physical activity over a period of time take time to 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 develop, and that's why we talk about a lifetime or a lifestyle rather, lifestyle of being physically active on a regular basis. So we hope that you've enjoyed the presentation here, and um, our next part of this presentation is going to go into detail of the exercise prescription. So how do we write an exercise prescription? Um, we write it using this FIT formula. We talk about how often you should exercise. So frequency, how many times a week should I exercise? What we talked about so far today was what? It should be at least three days a week. 
the intensity level, how hard should I work? Well, we heard that it should be at a moderate level of intensity. We heard that it should be a challenge, all right? And then time, how long should my routine be? Well, we know we want to accumulate 150 minutes in a week. We want to get between 30 to 60 minutes in a day. And at the very least, we want to try to do something for at least 10 minutes, even if we got to take a break to get our 30 minutes in and do it three times, we want to try to um, extend that. So. And then, of course, there's progression that's built into that. Maybe I go from 10 minutes to 12 minutes to 15 minutes. And then the last T in the formula is what type? What types of exercises are safe for me? What type of exercises and physical activity can I do with the equipment I have? Are you a member of a fitness center? Do you have equipment at home? Do you like taking a walk? Do the elements outside uh, avail yourself to be outside? So your mode of exercise, what you like to do and, and what you have available to you, are important with that exercise prescription. So that's coming next. All right, so part two of this presentation is called How Do I Start the General Guidelines for Healthy Adults? If you want more information on exercise as medicine, you can visit the American College of Sports Medicine website, exerciseismedicine.org, for all the resources. They're free resources, and there's a number of nice, nice uh, resources on that website. You can always contact me. It's Don Tomaszewski. I'm the Director of Lifestyles fitness center here uh, in, in Mawa. And um, there's my email. So if you want to send me a question or give us a call, I'd be happy to answer your questions. Otherwise, hope you tune into part two of this presentation and we'll talk more specifically about the exercise prescription and how you can set up an exercise program. Thank you.